Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome along to the next of our uh, Data Science Festival sessions uh, that we're obviously running for the whole month of November. Uh, it's been great fun so far. We've, we've absolutely loved it, our end. Uh, obviously, hope you guys have been enjoying connecting in as well. Um, one of the things we've really tried to do with this whole month is uh, have a, a really nice mix of sessions, uh, which we have available for all of you. Uh, and today is definitely going to be uh, no different to that. Um, in terms of today's session, uh, we're joined by Anders Sorman nielsen uh, He's a global futurist, uh, internationally recognized speaker, uh, delivers keynote sessions all across the world, uh, published author uh, in this area as well. And uh, what we're looking to, to get out of today's session um, is very much a look at um, where we are now, uh, where the world's going, uh, and where we will be going with technologies uh, going forward. Um, it's definitely aimed to be an interactive session uh, when I welcome Anders to the, to the stage. Uh, he's going to be delivering 40 to 45 minutes of content, uh, and we'll also have space at the end for a Q&A with him. So uh, as you'll see in the uh, Zoom software, uh, there's scope there for the Q&A function. Uh, please do get involved. Uh, you know, we're keen to hear from you guys uh, and, yeah, really looking to hear, hear your questions. Um, we do also have a, a Slack community, uh, which is running away in the background. Uh, there'll be a link to that in the chat uh, if you want to get involved there. Uh, and as ever, also with the social media as well. Um, just one quick announcement. Obviously, we do keep the Data Science Festival free to attend. Uh, there is a, a few costs involved, uh, a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, and we are able to keep it free to attend thanks to our sponsors. Uh, this year, our sponsors are Facebook, Gusto, Depop, Data IQ. Deliv Deliveroo, uh, Royal Mail, uh, ASOS, and of course, Data Idols. Uh, in terms of the session, uh, we've got a very short two minute intro video, uh, which I'm gonna share now. Uh, that's gonna set the scene uh, for, for Anders uh, keynote. Uh, once we've watched that two minute video, uh, I welcome Anders to the, uh, to the stage, as I say, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, if you give me one second, uh, I'll just share uh, this short intro video. Uh, and be right with you. So uh, technology, we have got this. Okay. Perfect. Here we have it. Imagine the following thought experiment. You are the science fiction author of your own business, life and career. And you get to be the creative genius for your own minority report your own avatar, your own man in the high castle. To do a pre-mortem as opposed to a post-mortem on your life's most important projects. You hold the embryo of your own future, no matter whether it's a dystopia or a utopia. You get to engage in a thought experiment that is scenario planning. The outcomes of scenario planning are to create four different alternative future worlds so that you can withstand future shock, no matter whether dystopia or utopia unfolds. In an exponential world of change, where change has never been this fast and will never be this slow again, steep factors, sociocultural, technological, economic, environmental, and political factors are drivers of change you need to identify. You then need to select and decode the top two, which can be visualized on a dimension, on an X and Y axis, and which are the most disruptive and impactful for your future. For example, digital transformation, or technological unemployment, courtesy of artificial intelligence, to create four different future worlds, like digital dystopia, e-commerce euphoria, the devolution of trust, and a human creative renaissance, for example. In this thought experiment that is scenario planning, you get to be the creative genius that designs a better tomorrow. See you in the future. Perfect. So Anders, uh, welcome. Welcome along, man. So one thing I didn't mention at the start there is Anders is joining us uh, all the way from Australia. Uh, so it's a very late evening for Anders. Uh, coming to say hello to us here. So how, how's things going with you today, uh, Anders? 
Yeah, I'm very well. Um, I know what you're all going to be having for dinner later on tonight, given that I'm dialing in from the future. So it was a beautiful spring day here. I, I gather that uh, things are cooling down a little bit where you guys are. Not, not quite the same for us, but hopefully uh, in terms of our audience, actually, although we're UK based, you should have people joining from uh, a few different countries as well. So uh, the future prediction will come in handy for all of us, I'm sure. So if you're happy, Anders, uh, I'll get out of the way uh, and leave you to deliver your session and I'll come and join you for the Q&A at the end. Cool. Fantastic. Have a good one. Well, hopefully uh, at this stage, uh, most of you can sort of tune into my Swedish Australian accent at least a little bit. Hopefully it makes some, some kind of sense. Uh, before we get kick started, ladies and gentlemen, I should just say that uh, courtesy of the Data Science Festival and all of your sponsors, all the slides are available for you to download. Uh, if you really just want to pay attention throughout the session as well, uh, this is way more of a HD experience, but you could also download the slides and have them there and print them out to your heart's content if you've got a really analog heart as well. Now, in many ways, this year, the future arrived sooner than we all thought. In fact, it arrived a little too soon for some of us. Back in 1931, the uh, Country Gentleman magazine in the United States, which was the preeminent uh, publication for the agricultural economy at the time, Back in 1931, sat down with their editors, their creatives, their futurists to imagine what the American farmer of the future might look like 100 years down the track in 2031. Now, remember back in 1931, and I'm putting your ages to the test here, most American farms did not have a tractor. Most electricity on the farm. And in fact, uh, humans and animals were providing both the brawn and the brains for the farm. And at the same time, they imagineered the picture that you see on your right, a farmer managing his fleet of internet of things enabled devices remotely uh, via the latest LCD screens. This was the future that was imagined. And in fact, uh, this uh, already happens uh, in the farms around the world where through heat mapping, through precision technology, through precision farming, through drones, etc., we've truly entered the future. But for the rest of us, 2031 arrived in the year 2020 because of a little virus that we've all heard about. And yes, both lives and livelihoods have been massively impacted by these events. In my family, we've lost both lives and livelihoods, sadly, and the story is the same for families around the world. The future arrived a little sooner than we all thought. Now, no matter whether you're a data scientist, whether you're in HR or retail, for example, the reality is that courtesy of this pandemic, we've also seen how technology has become our only lifeline. And imagine this pandemic without e-commerce, WhatsApp, FaceTime, Storytime, Uber Eats or Deliveroo, for example. It would have been an extremely tough place to be. So in some ways, uh, if I had to choose a pandemic to live through, uh, despite the fact in our, in our family, easy to say if you're Swedish, that we've lost both lives and livelihoods, uh, I'd still pick this one. We have a scientific a technologically driven uh, and in many ways uh, an innovative way of approaching this particular pandemic, particularly when we compare it to previous events through history. Now, as a futurist, I'm also a little bit of a traditionalist at heart. And let me just tell you one simple story of why on earth a futurist would also be a little bit of a traditionalist and dare I say it, maybe a little bit of a humanist. So before we talk about three major trends impacting the world today and also beyond the virus, let me take you back on a historical journey back into the past, back to my native city of Stockholm, Sweden, to a time that was just a little simpler, where things moved a little slower. Things were sort of more black or white. 
they were not as grayscale as they seem to be in this complex web of events that we currently find ourselves in. And this here was the urban vista that once upon a time back in the 1910s, just prior to the Spanish flu hitting Europe, greeted a man by the name of Gior Juan Son, or as we'd call him here in Australia, George Johansson. Sounds very Viking-esque, the son of Johan. As the second oldest son on the family farm, he had few inheritance rights. And as a result, he had to make his own commercial future in the cityscape of Stockholm. And after completing a retail apprenticeship for nearly six years, he decided in the year 1916, two years before the Spanish flu hit our shores, to open up his first bricks and mortar menswear store, his opportunity to dress the increasingly sophisticated Swedish gentleman of the era. And this was a time before Zoom calls, before Instagram, before selfies, and even before selfie sticks, when looking into a camera was still very much of a technological novelty. And George Johansson's business model was all about the face to face, the human touch, the belly to belly, the human connection. And in a cap nod of approval to his agrarian roots and his family property in West Gothland, as he became a man of commerce, he decided to change his surname from Johansson to the man from the Southern farm. Now, he's my great grandfather. And as you can tell, he must have been a bit of a futurist because he's got an awesome haircut, uh, a cool little pocket square. And you can also see that we share some genealogical traits with North Korean dictators as well. And he invested in the latest technology of the era, the neon sign, to win the then analog hearts and the then analog minds of yesteryear's customers. But for my mother, Birgitta, who looks pretty amazing for a 106 year old, as you can tell, we moisturize in my family and my mum dresses me every day of the week still. For her, the business environment, even pre-COVID, had massively changed. We know that today's customer consumer is almost like a cyborg, a person whose mental and physical abilities are extended courtesy of new technologies. And of course, the customer would spend some time with my mom face to face up until recently, have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine with her while scanning barcodes to really empower their digital minds to price compare in real time. Now, this was devastating news to my mom's business because the client would say, hey, we'll think about it. And you know, they're not going to think about it. They would then go to the door and to the sound of a very, very lonely little bell, they would exit the store around the corner and order the item on mrporter.com instead. Now, through the era, the pre-pandemic era of digital disruption, this really destroyed my mom's business model. And the way she ran this business in a highly anti-data scientific manner uh, with a pen and paper, one, two, three, four, five uh, skews of a particular nature. Uh, that's her version of big data, by the way. You can imagine that doesn't compare so well well, with Mr. Porter or Netta Porter or uh, Amazon.com forward slash fashion, for example. The reality is that her business model in many ways was perfectly prepared for a world that no longer exists. And these particular challenges showed up during the pandemic. Now, we know from scientific evidence that the pandemic has over indexed for our seniors, but it's also exposed pre-existing health condi conditions. It's also exposed pre-existing business conditions. And the reality for my mum is that her digital transformation did not begin soon enough. A few years ago, to try and convince my mum that there was a different future, I wrote a little love letter called, called the Digilog to my mum, how to win the digital minds and the analog hearts of tomorrow customers. Now, this has the ears of Fortune 500 organization CEOs around the world and Australia's oldest bank, the second largest bank in Australia, Westpac, credits the ideas in this book with them moving from number four in terms of retail banking, customer satisfaction to number one. Unfortunately for me, the person I wrote this little love letter for has not yet read the love letter. I feel like a stalker to my own mom. 
uh, dare I say that she's my toughest pro bono client and that there's certainly some intergenerational tension at play. But really, uh, she's also a case study in many ways. And by the way, my mum has given me permission to talk about her here out in the virtual ether this evening. Really, she showcases this kind of shifting of lanes that we've all had to go through from the analog world into the digital future in an era where technology has become our own lifeline. For her, the choice was stark because she thinks of the digital world as digitally dehumanized, yet at the same time during the pandemic, it's been the only way we've been able to scale our humanity. Now, some of us think about the pandemic as a black swan event. Uh, in other words, uh, up until the time when Australia, incidentally, was, uh, was discovered uh, from the olden world by the Brits, then uh, at the time, we only knew of white swans. So the idea of a black swan event is something that is hard to predict uh, and is something that takes us by surprise. It's become a metaphor for things like the global financial crisis, for example, or the September 11 attack. Now, it's also been metaphorically uh, applied to the pandemic as well. However, the author of the book, The Black Swan, Nicholas Taleb, who popularized the term said that just using the term black swan for this event uh, is inaccurate. And we shouldn't use that as an excuse for being unprepared for the fact that the future arrived sooner than we all thought. I take some inspiration from one of my futurist for bears, Alvin Toffler, who said that the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And I think the pandemic really highlights that this is a chance for all of us to learn, unlearn and relearn a few things. Today, I wanna to talk to you about three major trends impacting all of us today and beyond the virus. And I'm not just talking about flash in the pan events on uh, things like we've seen this year, how to make sourdough or kombucha at home. We are talking about longer term trends that are mega trends that will be shaping the future beyond the virus as well. And one of the science fiction or thought experiments that I'd like to run with you here today is to imagine what the future economic recovery journey looks like over the next five years and also specifically for your personal brands and organizational brands how we rebuild trust with consumers and customers and stakeholders whose investment and consumer confidence might have been shattered by recent events and also might be entering a world where our fundamental human values and customer behaviors are also shifting Hopefully this sounds like a plan because there's no plan B. So this is what we're going to go with. And as I said, we're going to be addressing major trends. Uh, if you haven't done trend analysis before, a really, really useful and practical framework is to use the STEEP model. STEEP stands for socio-cultural, technological, economic, environmental, and political trends. And certainly if you were going to run that trend analysis or those uh, five letters across the year, that is 2020, it's pretty easy to populate a trend analysis chart like this one. Again, courtesy of the Data Science Festival, the slides are downloadable for you beyond this talk as well. So we'll make sure we send you the link to that uh, very, very shortly. This leads us to the idea of this pandemic in some ways being preferred compared to other historical events prior. Now, one of the things that is in some ways heartening about this particular pandemic is that we've been able to be very data scientific. This should be good news to all of you and very scientific minded. Now let's compare and contrast that to the black plague and let's cast our minds back to a different era where at the time in Rome, the Pope decided because he believed that cats were the vectors of the devil to kill off cats as well as dogs. Uh, of course, they were the natural enemy of rats who in fact carried the bacteria at the time, which 
ensured that the exponential impact of this bacteria would be even further exacerbated. Compare and contrast that to today's scientific and technologically driven approach to the pandemic, where we've been able to track and trace, yes, not flawlessly, but certainly better compared to the Spanish flu or the Black Plague. We've taken a scientific approach to ensuring that healthcare has been boosted around the world. We've been able to switch manufacturing towards PPEs from other industries, and we've been able to scale our humanity courtesy of telehealth. And I think this is heartening for the future. And again, as I said, this makes me prefer this pandemic over any other that we've previously experienced as humanity. The concept here is that we can digitally scale our humanity and code for humanity. The first trend that I'd like to decode here today is the fact that every business model is now getting digitally hacked, or at least it should be, increasingly at exponential rates. Now, humans don't necessarily, as I've discussed before, like to shift lanes from left to right or from the analog world to the digital world. Now, back in 1967, the Swedish government decided to illustrate this point that Swedes were gonna shift from left lane driving to right lane driving because that is the future of transport for all of you who are in an Anglo country or in the UK or here in Australia for that matter. Now, it was every ambulance chasing lawyers Disneyland at the time, as you can see. And the big change management mantra from the Swedish government was, just smile, we're all just new at this, right? Isn't that a wonderful change management mantra when you roll out your next CRM system uh, or ERP system in your organization? But let's compare and contrast that mayhem to this era, an era of increasingly sensorily aware IoT connected devices. And let's imagine for a moment sending your kids, your nieces, your nephews out to school, to preschool, to work, or even your elderly grandmother confidently across this intersection in her wheelchair. Now, according to the World Economic Forum, over the next decade, we'll be able to save 1.1 million human lives courtesy of autonomously aware vehicles. A year ago on my last international holiday, uh, to Liguria, Italy. I must say I would welcome the days when humans are no longer behind the wheels, at least in Italy. Uh, and when I share this in Mumbai, India to one of our clients at Bharti Airtel, they said, Anders, this is nothing new. This is what it looks like in Mumbai every day of the week. And we have semi-autonomous cows as well. Increasingly, we can code for humanity and get empathy into the digital devices around us. And this is important because it will also lead to less human error and the inhumane consequences that flow from very gut-based or anti-scientific movements of humans and animals around us. And again, apologies here today if I'm bringing up some pretty traumatic events for you. If this one is particularly provocative for you or if you have loved ones, family, friends who were impacted by these particular events or associated events, I do apologize. And I also think the second example is a very heartening example of how the future courtesy of digital technologies is gonna be a more humane place than anything we've been able to accomplish before. And the truck on your left is the same make and model that on Bastille Day in Nice, France in 2016 was hijacked by a terrorist who then drove that truck for 1.6 kilometers down the Esplanade in the process tragically taking 92 lives, 482 people injured from that event and many more families suffering from the loss of loved ones. The truck on your right was built after a 2012 EU directive that stated that every truck on the roads of the EU had to be part of the Internet of Things, had to be equipped with sensors, and had to be equipped with an advanced braking system. Now, maybe foolishly, 
or maybe luckily, the terrorist in the Berlin Christmas market attack of the same year decided to hijack the truck on your right. And not after 1.6 kilometers, but with his foot still on the accelerator, after only 70 meters, the truck shut down the terrorist. The loss to human life, less than 10% of what we'd seen in this only a few months before. My mum always says, Anders, the digital world feels so digitally dehumanized, but I would argue that we can all code for humanity. We can all design for better outcomes in the products and services that we are responsible for and that we have an input into. Now, the great American thought leader and management guru, yes, George Costanza, uh, once said, for everything important in life, it needs to have a physical package. For your cash, there's your wallet. But of course, this isn't true today anymore. Uh, in fact, cash is no longer king. Cash is only a vector of the virus these days. Now, to illustrate the point that cash is no longer king, uh, the micro vendors on the streets of Stockholm selling our version of the big issue. So these are homeless people trying to get out of poverty by selling great journalism in the subway system and the public transport system saw their sales going down month over month. And somebody asked themselves, is it just a case that Swedes are heartless people without an empathetic pulse? Somebody else in that meeting said, or could it be that we live in the most cashless economy in the world, yet we only insist on taking cash for payment? They teamed up with iSettle, a mobile POS provider that enables biometric payments, NFC payments, credit card payments, mobile wallets. Sales went up 59% as a result of removing the friction between the positive intent to do business with these worthwhile brands and the seamless digital execution of handing over our Bitcoin or whatever it happens to be. Ask yourself in your own organization, what friction exists that prevents customers or stakeholders from doing business with you? And make sure that you get to work on fixing that. The digital world that so many of you are responsible for and certainly are participating in is also changing the nature of branding. Uh, you might know someone from the branding department or the marketing department who lives this stuff every day, but in fact, it's important for all of us, particularly the digirati amongst you. Now, the world of branding uh, prior to great technologies and the internet of things used to be back in the 1.0 days, all about brand voice, brands telling us what they stood for and hoping that we believe them. Then through uh, an evolution from a monologue essentially to a dialogue through social media, it became a two-way conversation via Facebook, for example, one of your sponsors for this event and one of our clients or through Google reviews, people were taking brands into their own hands. Now through the era of the internet of things, there's a trialogue happening between the brand and the consumer and the object. Let me explore with you what this looks like. Now, I'm just going to ask it here in the virtual ether. Who here gets a little bit, feel free to raise your hand, uh, a little bit nervous if your iPhone or Samsung battery starts running low? Okay, I'm sorry again for bringing up all these traumatic experiences. Now, one of the biggest challenges towards Tesla adoption around the world or EVs at that uh, has been our sense of what? Range anxiety. In other words, where's the next supercharger station going to be? Now, imagine being a Tesla owner a couple of hurricane seasons ago uh, in Florida and you're fleeing with your family and your most beloved belongings away from a hurricane, Hurricane Irma, who's chasing you down the highway as you are there with your family and most beloved ph photographies. Now, uh, Imagine your sense of anxiety as the Tesla battery starts running low. What kind of glances do you think you're getting across from the passenger seat? And do you think you're giving yourself a little bit of a clap on the shoulder for being an early adopter of new technologies at that point in time? You're probably feeling fairly stressed. And in fact, our heartbeats per minute has jumped through the roof in this virtual ether as we imagine this thought experiment. 
all of a sudden, Elon Musk comes across the dashboard and goes, fret not human, we've just safely remotely upgraded your battery via the cloud so you can safely get out of harm's way. True story. What do you think your relationship to that previously cold piece of technology has now just become? It's been anthropomorphized or humanized, right? You feel like the technology is looking after you. And this is a case of predictive customer experience. This also sets the expectation for the kinds of customer experiences that we'll all be expecting tomorrow. Today's luxury is tomorrow's expectation. Think about in your own organizations, what technologies you might want to invest in or pitch other people in investing in because they will be tomorrow's expectations. Yes, they might sound futuristic or even luxurious today, but tomorrow they will be an expectation and a hygiene factor. The other thing, of course, is that we're increasingly able to take the robot out of the human. Through technologies, humans can do less of the menial and more of the meaningful, less of the mundane and more of the humane. Increasingly, we don't have to do data entry to the same degree. If you're a data scientist, you can focus increasingly on analysis or turning data into information, into knowledge and true decision making. This is important as a shift because increasingly technology will do the robotic style of labor. And what we are seeing today is that the combination of the pandemic and also the rise of technology is ensuring that humans can step up and start creating a new creativity explosion. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, for example, is one of the people that in some ways emerged from the rubble of the Black Plague, which laid the foundations and the groundwork for the first Renaissance back uh, at the time in Florence where because of the pandemic, 50% of the population had been decimated. All of a sudden, labor was at a premium, which meant that even the noble men and women who paid for labor had to pay more because there was less labor around. Peasants were becoming merchants. Merchants were becoming new noble men and women as there was social mobility and even investments in novel technologies, novel labor saving technologies at the time because of the decimation of the labor force. It was a flourishing of human creativity and thought. And even previous recessions, like the Great Recession of the late 20 noughties, also were baptisms of fire for some of the brands that we now really herald and put up on a pedestal, like the emergence of the collaborative consumption or sharing economy movement with the rise of brands like Airbnb and Uber, which were really frugality brands. At the same time, brands like Taobao and JD.com and Alibaba, their baptisms of fire were during the SARS epidemic in China, where again, technology was the only lifeline and the only way to get groceries to your house. This is when China really overtook the you know, United States in terms of internet and e-commerce adoption. Ask yourself in your own organization, will this pandemic be a baptism of fire? Now, the great American, sorry, the, the great, I should say, UK science fiction author, Douglas Adams, once said that when it comes to our reactions towards new technologies, like some of the ones that I've already discussed with you here today, when it comes to those reactions, We've, you know, we've got a set of rules. Anything that's in the world when you're born is natural and normal and ordinary. It's just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between the ages of 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after the age of 35 is against the natural order of things. And I think this is the way my mum feels. And given that I'm 39, I'm also beyond the peak of inflated expectations as well, of course. I know I'm never gonna be a Snapchat analyst, for example. But this is how many of us feel about this new world that we're going into. And it leads us to our second trend here today, which is that we're embracing a new world of disrupting and augmenting human technology. We all need to start diversifying our cognitive 
active portfolios inside of our organizations and think long-term smart and responsibly. Let me decode for you what this means and how we can apply some thinking around this. Now, in the UK up until recently, there was really never a reason for the banks to innovate on the CX or the customer experience. Why? Because statistically, Britons were more likely to divorce their life partner than their primary bank. Little reason to innovate, right? But today, courtesy of mobile devices that are turning all of us into cyborgs, people whose mental and physical abilities are extended courtesy of new technologies, we no longer need to divorce our primary bank. We just cheat on them with a variety of fintechs instead who actually do for us the things we wish maybe banks had thought about. We are all becoming cyborgs. And this is one of my little cyborg heroes, little Max Harpen. Uh, he lives in Sydney, Australia, and he's the son of uh, one of my former colleagues and a good friend of mine, Emma Harpen, and her husband, Aaron Harpen. Really cool kid. He would have navigated the intersection you saw a moment ago on his skateboard without any problems. And this is really cool because when he was born, he was born profoundly deaf. If a freight train went past his back, he would have no auditory signal of that event whatsoever. But because of a great Australian innovation in biotech, biotechnology, the fusion of biology and technology, the cochlear implant of which he has two embedded into his skull, one behind each ear, he's able to have analog, he's able to have, I should say, digital signal where there wasn't even analog noise before, right? he is proudly their little cyborg son. Now, today we're all cyborg, right? Because in, this is the reason why at Tuesday night trivia at the pub, for example, they tell you to turn off your iPhone or your Samsung. Why? Because otherwise our mental abilities would be extended courtesy of Wikipedia and you would be cheating, right? There is a movement known as transhumanism which again sort of applauds this fusion of biology and technology. And according to the singularity time scale, the year when we'll be fully transformed as human beings uh, is not far away. Computing power back in 2015 trumped the brain power of a mouse. Amazing technological achievement, right? But we are at the knee of the curve where things are about to get really, really hectic. In fact, the rate of change has never ever been this fast and will never ever be this slow again. Aren't you happy they kind of threw a futurist at you, an inspirational speaker here today, right? By 2023, computing power is gonna trump the brain power of a human in New Zealand, okay? It's gonna take a little bit longer here in Australia and the UK and Ireland, et cetera, right? You are safe. I say exactly as same thing in New Zealand when I work with Rugby New Zealand about Australian Swedes always play both sides of the fence. So just so you know. And by 2045, computing power will trump the brain power of all of us combined. So I think in this race, I think it's better time for us to partner up with the machines. The machines and data and data visualization is also critical from a decision making perspective. So you guys are in a good seat for the future. Uh, just to illustrate this point of how humans sometimes struggle when we don't have good data to base our decisions on uh, is some research from the Australian government. Uh, they uh, commissioned this report into problem gambling and they asked themselves the question, audited, when Australians say they spent $100 on a household item or product or activity, for example, what did they actually spend audited? Now, when it comes to transport, Australians were fairly accurate, right? $100 is actually $104 audited. Now that comes out in the wash, depending on who's the CFO at home. But it gets more worrying. When we say we spent $100 at IKEA, the world's largest contributor to the high international divorce rates, the real audited amount was slightly higher, $132. Now we say, when we say, hey, we watched England play at the pub at the Ashes and beat Australia, spend hundred dollars, the real audited amount was $158. And never ever have your conferences near a casino, ladies and gentlemen, because when Australians say, hey, hun, spend hundred dollars at the casino last night, the real audited amount was $735. When humans listen to their gut feel, as opposed to data scientific analysis, 
we suck, right? Let's compare and contrast that to a world where we're all quantified. A few years ago, a few too many years ago, I ran the New, Year, New York Marathon and I did so spontaneously with 16 hours preparation and two beers in Brooklyn to do my carb loading ahead of the race. I always sort of knew that the last 25 miles, the, you know, the last 39 kilometers were really going to suck. Uh, but at least to my aid in my back pocket, I had a little piece of software and hardware, the combination of Nike Plus and the iPhone, enabling me to quantify and digitize every step of the way. Now, if I ever did want to run the race ever again, I don't recommend you try a spontaneous marathon at home, I would be better prepared, I'd like to imagine. Based on the data, I could tell the couple of times I slowed down epically to just hide from the world and go to the bathroom or when I sped up to go through more dangerous neighborhoods. I also got a sense based on topographical maps and heat maps, how I might do better next time around or how I could complete this epic life project of getting from A to B or figure out how to overtake some of my competition a little bit sooner than the halfway mark. Now, of course, for every breath I make, for every step I take, Nike, I know, is watching me. And they are able to send me personalized recommendations based on my activities every day of the week. And they know for somebody like me who used to run in Asus hardware, once I log into the Nike software five times, their big data tells them I'm more likely to buy which kind of product. Swoosh, just do it. This is the new world of data where we can make new decisions. One of our clients is Lego, family owned brand out of Denmark. Now we think of Lego, and by the way, I should say that my three-year-old son, Lucian, this is his favorite. Offense to data science festival, but Lego is his favorite client brand of mine. Now we think of Lego as a brand for kids and please do Google the following very, very carefully toys for adults. This based on Lego's analysis and data science was a huge growth opportunity. And they're seeing huge gains, not just in their sales to adults, but also in the way that they position themselves as a multi-generational brand where they are in many ways beyond the brick. They thought of themselves as a kid's brand but the data showed them that adults were using Lego games, Lego constructions. Are you prepared to have your own identity challenged based on your data? Are there people inside of your organization who you need to present data to in new ways so they understand that who they were as an organization back in the day may no longer suffice for the future? The question is, how can we better equip our colleagues with tools that will amplify their human intelligence, such as data visualization tools? Because of this, we're of course now living in this pre-world that is predictive, preemptive, preactive, preparatory, even precognitive for any fans of the minority report, right? And brands understand how to use this for innovation for creativity. There might be some legal and there might be some illegal users of Netflix in the audience here today. Now, for those of you who are legal users of Netflix, let me tell you a story. The story pertains to all of us, of course, but Netflix used to distribute their content with a pigeon to people's physical inboxes, DVDs being sent via snail mail. Then they shifted the distribution model from the analog world into the digital ether. And all of a sudden, of course, they could eavesdrop on all of us. They knew what time of the day people would be likely to watch certain series, for example. This enabled them to shift the business model into the future. They knew a large portion of their database loved Kevin Spacey pre-controversy, at least, and since 
him being pronounced non-guilty as an actor. They love David Fincher as a director. And if you overlay a successful UK script over the top from 20 years earlier, you've got the perfect Venn diagram for success. Imagine knowing even before you invest in a particular series that it's going to be a success. Even the Pantone colors were AB split tested to make sure that the best Pantone colors based on AB split testing would go into the eventual posters. Data science informing the creative. I mean, this is powerful stuff, right? Even creatives are now realizing that can only truly be customer and human centric if they're also data centric. This should be good news to all of you. But it's not just about technologies augmenting us. It's also increasingly about us embracing cognitive diversity. In fact, for organizations that are not cognitively or gender or ethnically or culturally diverse, they are paying a penalty today. We all have to upgrade our cognitive diversity, not just the optics of an organization, but also the way people think and have different types of thinking embraced. The research shows us the, the more diverse an organization is, the more revenue they are generating from new products, according to the Boston Consulting Group. In other words, the more diverse, the more revenue we get from innovation. Companies that are not diverse are paying a penalty in terms of profit, growth, and revenue. Now, one of my favorite tools to exist is called the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. It's a blue chip psychometric test where we test for left brain thinking and right brain thinking. And from a technology perspective, this should be interesting because organizations and educational systems around the world have been heralding STEM, sciences, technology, engineering, and maths, which of course are critical for the future. In many ways, that's the left brain. It's the blue and green styles of thinking. But what has been less pronounced is the yellow and the red, the right brain thinking, creativity, interpersonal skills, emotional intelligence, entrepreneurship, and innovation. These have to exist together. And if you were to map your organization, do you think that they would err more on the right or more on the left? Or are you truly whole brain? Because creativity and innovation, according to the Harvard Business Review, happens through creative abrasion. In other words, collaboration between people who view the world differently, who think and communicate differently. And in a recent, a recent research paper we were commissioned to do for Microsoft, we position the future for retailers as one where technology and AI is doing more of the menial and the mundane and humans are increasingly able to, in a retail context, do more of the meaningful and the humane. This is leading to a new human creativity explosion. And we know that technology will probably eventually do all types of work, but we have to ask ourselves the question, what can they already do? What can they not do at the moment, but probably in the future? And which types of jobs might technology even innovate and create for us? And I would argue that only focusing on STEM skills for ourselves and our kids is gonna set us up for a world where computers and robots will probably trump us at those skills. But to embrace our creativity, our innovation, our entrepreneurship, and more of our interpersonal emotional intelligence, this is the way of the future. And the great thing is that these things can also be taught. Now, oftentimes we are scared about technological unemployment, but technology doesn't just replace humans. It can also augment us. And in a case in point of this is the humble ATM, the automatic telling machine. Now, if you thought about a bank worker back in the day in the 90s, 60s. And if you thought their only role in life was to dispense cash faster or take in cash faster, well, maybe they would have been made redundant. 
But in fact, the rise of the ATM has also gone with the rise of the number of bank branches around the world. Now, this might sound kind of old school given the new era of fintech, but it's also enabled humans to focus more on relationship-based banking. For example, people coming in for more strategic advice, whether in the analog or in the digital world. And in fact, it's led to a boost in banking employment since the first ATMs were implemented back in the 1960s. And this leads us to our final trend here today. And I'm going to do a quick digital time check as well to make sure we're running to time. That is that transformation needs to sit at the core of every human's contribution for the future to make sure that we're actually sustainable into the future and also for every organization to embrace the transformation economy. Nike understands how it positions itself as a true transformation partner, helping me and other hacks, for example, run a marathon. But every organization today needs to truly step into and become true partners right? God or your spirit or whatever it happens to be knows that we have to be part of improving humanity into the future and certainly looking after our planet. And when it comes to positioning ourselves as transformation partners from a technology perspective or even internal stakeholder management perspective, what we have to learn is to tell a better story. Why? Because we are living in a world where there's a trust deficit. What is trust? Well, trust is to have a confident relationship in the unknown, such as the future, getting out of our comfort zone into our discomfort zone. And what is the bridge between that? Is somebody telling us a believable story, a digitally verified story of how we get from here to here, right? whether it's new technologies like autonomous cars or digital currency, somebody had to tell us a story that made sense and connected with our analog souls, right? If it comes to Airbnb, we have to get used to the idea of the sharing economy. Then the platform like the brand Airbnb. And finally, the hyper-individualized or the hyper-localized hosts on that platform or tenants right? This helps us move from the comfort zone to the uncomfort zone, right? And technology can do this, right? For example, De Beers is now using blockchain technology, almost like from farm to fork or paddock to plate, but now with mining to tell you that your beautiful De Beers jewelry, for example, is from a blood-free or a conflict-free mine. And they prove the story from mine to retail, all the way through based on blockchain technologies. The sustainability story in all of this is important. And again, we have technology to thank for the fact that sustainability is back on the agenda. We know renewable energy is incredibly important, but how do we tell the story of the rise of renewable energy, the data that supports the story in a more visualized and a more engaging fashion that truly wins both digital minds and analog hearts. Well, some of the stories around this is about really building slack into our systems. This is Mike Bowen. Mike Bowen had a challenging time telling his database story, his supply chain story to the American national stockpile and also to both the Trump and Obama administrations. He's a manufacturer of PPE or personally pro uh, protective personal equipment, right? Like masks, for example. At the time of the H1N1 flu in America, he was a primary contributor and manufacturer. Then uh, an American buying group that buys up PPE equipment and the national or stockpiling center started going just for outsourcing and the lowest bidder and outsource most of the production to China. This means that they have blood on their hands. This guy was lobbying the American government to make sure that there would still be production on their shores, but he failed to truly tell a compelling story. As a result, the American population 
and the first responders were oftentimes left without PPE. We have to become better at telling the stories, building slack into our systems, building slack into our environment. Some of us have heard the saying that really COVID-19 or the pandemic has been like an invoice sent from mother earth to ourselves to truly get on with things and to change the way we do things. Changing the way we do things might mean changes to our supply chains. For example, today, urban farming get more outputs from less inputs, like plenty farms, for example. At a plenty farm, they can house 350 times more produce than a traditional field farm of a similar size. And it uses 1% as much water, no pesticides, and they use seeds that are developed for flavor and not durability to travel long distances. Again, less inputs, more outputs. An example of this is technology, again, like the iPhone. Now, if we think back a few days, back to 1991, in this Radio Shack ad, for example, you'll see 13 different products, fax machines, VCRs, recorders, headphones, etc., media players. Now, this is all housed in iPhones, which are largely also recycled, right? All of those products exist in your iPhone today. And this is critical because technology enables us to tread less harshly on the planet. Technology enables us to get more from less. Are you telling that story inside of your organization? I want to finish not with three silver bullet points for all of you because futurists don't do that because it would close your creative wheels and stop them from being in motion, but rather we ask questions. And my question to all of you is to almost imagine a bit of a pre-mortem, better to do that than a post-mortem. Imagine that it's now 2025 and on your watch, your company went belly up. What were the trends that you just missed? What were the signals that you deliberately chose to ignore? And what were the investment decisions either in yourself or in your organization in both artificial and human resources that just delayed and delayed um, or which led to that demise, I should say. And instead, what change will you make today at the Data Science Festival that will prevent that from happening? Now, I made the argument earlier in this presentation that we're entering a new dawn, a new era, an era hopefully beyond the virus, where we can see a renewed optimism. The Renaissance stands for a revival or a rebirth of classic humanistic thought. And just like in that pandemic of the Black Plague, which led to the emergence of the first renaissance. So I believe that increasingly we'll see new connectivity, new interplay between artificial and human resources and the connectivity between man and machine, woman and machine. The interplay of the best of human intelligence as well as artificial intelligence and the re-embracing of human creativity humanism, emotional intelligence, and interpersonal skills that can drive even more entrepreneurship and sustainability for our planet. It's time to start preparing for that future because it is where we're all, all gonna spend the rest of our lives. Thank you very much for hanging out, hanging out this evening, this morning, this afternoon, and I look forward to seeing you in that future. Thank you very much for hanging out. Anders, so good, man. Thank, thank you very, very much. And uh, it's nice to, uh, to have some positivity uh, as well. I, I took very much a positive message uh, from your presentation there. So th thank you for, for sharing. Um, we are looking, if you have time still, uh, to, to cover off a couple of quick questions. Uh, it'd be nice to get your take on a, on a few points, uh, if, if that's okay with you. Have you got five, 10 minutes just to stick around? I, I, I'm, I'm good. Uh, apologies for going a little bit over. My analog watch was, uh, was leaving me behind. Great. I, I love it. I love it. 
Uh, mate, we're going to jump straight in. Um, so the, the, I've, I've got a few few questions myself, a few talking points. People have actually been messaging me directly for this one, which is uh, which is a pleasure. So I'll get to those. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in on the Q&A as well. Uh, and equally, anyone still watching, if you have questions, please put, put them in there. Um, the first two questions are from uh, Josna uh, and Ekaterina, um, and they both actually relate to uh, COVID and the future of work. Uh, first question, uh, you know, is working from home here to stay post COVID? Uh, if so, you know, what does those, what do those changes mean for, for workers? Um, and then Ekaterina, very similar sort of question. Um, what do you think is the main technology, technological change of the workforce and workplace post pandemic? So wh where is the world of work going, uh, in your opinion, going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think um, so it's definitely going to be a, a digilog or a hybrid approach to, to work. I don't, um, I don't foresee people going back to, you know, the central business district uh, en masse and anytime soon. Uh, people have fallen in, well, there have been challenges, including with my three-year-old, um, but, you know, um, you know, I still love working from home. Yes, we have an office, but I also work from home. Um, you know, people have just gotten used to the new productivity gains as well. Even if they are disrupted, you know, they have, they're they not commuting for an hour and a half each, each direction, for example. So having a few, you know, having to do a little bit of extra laundry or having, a, 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 you know, a kid running into a web conference in the middle of it, uh, you know, we've all become, you know, used to that. And it's quite humanizing. We're all bringing our human selves, our emotional selves to work. And I think that's, you know, that's a positive. Um, you know, there, there's obviously organizations like Facebook and Twitter who, can, who are just saying to their staff, you know, you can work from home forever if you want. I think humans will still crave, you know, the, the, the personal touch, the human touch, you know, well sanitized, of course, um, into the future. But I would say, you know, somewhere by, you know, 25 to even 50%, I would imagine, of corporate office space, you know, will now be redundant. They can build vertical farms in those instead. Um, because, you know, the, you know, the workplace, the, the CBD has truly been decentralized, right? And again, you know, technology has become the lifeline for that. I think um, it's, it's probably been an eye-opener for a lot of corporates to realize how efficient their staff are at, ho at home. You know, it's almost been an excuse, I feel, to, to get them into the central business district. And, that, and now they've been forced to acknowledge we can, we can run remotely. The technology does work. Uh, so it's interesting to hear your, your take on that. And, and beyond, beyond yeah, that, I, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I think long term, I think maybe the challenge will be, you know, a cultural one. Um, how, how do you truly like, how do you truly get, you know, the special, you know, I'm sorry for using Facebook all the time, but they are a client, you know, how do you get that special, you know, Facebook, um, you know, culture in, in Viewed if you're, you know, if you're recruiting digitally from here, there, and everywhere, are people truly going to feel, you know, a part of that organisation? That's that is a question mark. Um, you know, we've we've done work with, you know, organisations like Teleperformance, for example, which, you know, some, not everyone has heard of that organisation, but you know, if you ever ever had Apple support in a contact centre, Teleperformance are the ones who deliver it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they are employees of teleperformance, but in the contact center, they very much live the brand of Apple. They have to kind of wear two hats. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because Apple provides great training to them and they get imbued in that culture. And the question is, how, how's that gonna happen, you know, when it's all just digital? Yeah, and following on with this, actually, we've had another question coming from Carmen Lee, um, and she's talking specifically around creativity. Uh, and her question is, you know, how do we keep creativity up uh, as we are working from home? Uh, and have fewer opportunities to be in the same room and and create. Uh, have you got an opinion on that? Yeah, I think I think you know great technology is hopefully what's going to enable that. I think um, you know whether it's you know whether it's Slack or, or data visualization software, etc. I would maybe just like share a resource. We've just been I've been hosting. Um, uh, LinkedIn live series with for Adobe and we co-created the Adobe CQ or the Adobe creative quotient recently the diagnostic to test your you know creative leadership skills and and so we have leaders from across Asia Pacific um, and they're all exploring various ways um, that you know during remote work 
they've still been able to keep, you know, the creative culture alive inside of organizations. And of course, you know, a lot of that has, you know, happened by, you know, great UX and, and, and various technologies, um, sometimes in-house technologies for some of these tech players and sometimes things that they've had as a, you know, software as a service, for example. So I think, the, the, you know, the software is still key, you know, hackathons can still happen, you know, digitally, of course, you know, um, but of course, there's also some things that, you know, we do miss, you know, just being able to get up to, you know, a whiteboard and, you know, being able to draw and, and, and mind map, you know, maybe I'm old school, but it still feels like it's, you know, there are some things that miss in, in, in the digital ether in that regard. The water cooler chats is the, is the one, eh? the impromptu bump into someone in the company kitchen or whatever. And um, we're going to change tack slightly, actually. Uh, question from Paul McCaffrey. Uh, I'm guessing Paul has specific interest in the healthcare uh, sector. Uh, and he was asking, uh, you know, in the, sh in, in the near term, uh, where do you see uh, healthcare transforming? Oh, wow. That's, uh, That's a proper yeah, change. Broad, 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 broad question, you know. <laughs> um, we've got a few, you know, we've got a few healthcare clients. I, I would say that probably, you know, a ma major shift is going to be that, you um, Healthcare would be uh, increasingly predictive um, and going to be less about sick care and more about actually, you know, trying to get people to, you know, from everything from boosting their immunity to, to, to using, you know, um, trackers and implantables and wearables and hearables, et cetera, so that, you know, we have a good data set that enables us to make, you know, smarter decisions down to, you know, people uh, truly using, you know, their 23 and me and, um, you know, other, other genetic and, and DNA tests to, to know what we're predisposed to. Um, so I think it will be a much more data-based approach and one that's truly about, you know, preventative healthcare as opposed to just dealing with an issue once it's, once it's appeared. Uh, hopefully that goes some way to, to, to talking about. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for, from my perspective, I'm an absolute uh, about healthcare for this, this type of stuff, you know, like aura ring where you can track your sleep and thriver doing home blood tests. And uh, again, maybe it's the data aspect, but I, I love collecting all that data. And, and ultimately you would hope that does have a positive long-term uh, health impact. Uh, I guess what one question I had, uh, you know, I won't keep you too long, maybe a couple more questions just to give the guys a bit more of a flavor. But what one of the questions I had as you were talking was, um, you know, previous industrial revolutions, the agricultural revolution, you know, technology actually potentially created more jobs. Uh, in the instance of healthcare, artificial intelligence, looking for heart defects from images using computer vision, and um, the jobs that are actually being impacted in this revolution are actually much more higher skilled. You know, people will spend hundreds of thousands of pounds to become a doctor and they're potentially parts of their roles replaced by AI. And um, do you think that there'll be a, a long-term impact on the more experienced type of jobs like that? And people have to move more towards the creative side and the creative industries. Uh, do, do you think this revolution will be different and impact different level of people? I think, I think you know, there, there's a um, yeah. There, there, there's a few books and a few you know few authors who, who talk about this, and I think one of the one of the most uh, convincing arguments that I've heard is that you know oftentimes we err on the side of of thinking about you know whole scale loss of jobs, like there won't be you know there won't be lawyers or bankers in the future. I, I actually you know I don't think that that's the accurate analysis, but I think. If you you know break your work day to you know six or eight or ten hours or whatever it happens to be, and, and and you look at the tasks you do, you know it's unfortunately you know I don't just sit around futuristing all day long. You know there's there's also unfortunately there's still you know despite what I said in the presentation there's still you know some you know, occasional data entry to do, or, you know, there's menial paperwork sometimes to do, or, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I don't like to talk to, um, you know, our broadband or internet provider, sometimes I need to give an authorization for someone, <laughs> someone else to do it. You know, there's, there's still really menial stuff. So, you know, 
ask yourself, you know, how much of your work day is doing like routine, you know, high volume stuff. Yeah. That's where you want, you know, technology to, 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 you know, increasingly play a role. Um, you know, just in our small business, for example, you know, we, we, we love the fact that on, you know, on the zero book, you know, bookkeeping platform that, you know, it also has AI embedded that, you know, does, you know, recognition and, and, and sort of predictive bookkeeping and we, you know, the humans can still go in and check it. Um, but you know, that, 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 you know, that saves our accountant a lot of time and saves my wife, who's the CFO, uh, the hobby CFO a lot of time when she looks over all the books. So. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to two more very quick questions and then we'll draw things to a close. Uh, obviously, you, you were talking very much about transformation, preparing for the future. And um, you obviously deal with some very large companies, Adobe, Facebook, etc. Uh, a number of our audience will be doing from smaller companies, from startups. Uh, do you have any tips specifically to startups? Do they have to approach it slightly different to be prepared? Or is it same approach across different organization sizes? I mean, yeah, I mean, this is a gross generalization, but I feel like a lot of little, little startups, you know, today, you know, it depends on the industry, but um, I feel like they're starting up because, you know, they have something new to offer that, you know, they're challenging incumbents and, and, and often times, uh, again, I could be, you know, dead wrong on this, but, you know, they, they tend to be digital first, you know, in, in terms of what they're, you know, and also just in terms of scale and costs. Um, you know, they tend to be, you know, digitally native companies to, to a degree. So, you know, I think digital transformation is not something that's, or digital disruption is not necessarily something that's going to hit them because, you know, they're already utilizing technologies and, and, you know, infrastructure as a service, you know, software as a service, et cetera, that, you know, that, you know, their whole models are built on. So um, I think they'll be buoyed by these technologies if, if, if anything else, um, I'm not sure whether the question is in terms of like how to build brand, etc. But you know, um, or what what the underlying kind of question is there. But I, I think um, I would say that you know you've, the you've fact hit, that hit, hit, hit the nail on the head. If you're starting, all right, stuff, okay, you're <laughs> ready for disruption. It's good. All right, uh, mate. Yeah. Fine, fine. From you me. are you are the disruptors, you know. So. <laughs> uh, final one for me. Uh, obviously, we're talking a lot about change. Uh, given all the change, uh, you know, what are the things that are not going to change over the next decade? Is it all changing or what are the things that perhaps might not? Yeah, um, uh, you know, the, Jeff Bezos said that, you know, people, people sometimes over obsess with, with, you know, with change and, you know, um, disruption, etc. But he said, you know, if, if you can find like a trend that's going to be around for the next 10 years, you can build, you know, a business model around that because it actually gives you some, some certainty. And, you know, that comes from one of the most disruptive companies, you know, of the last, you know, 20 or 30 years. So 20 years, I should say. So, um, so I think that, you know, I think that's really like an interesting piece, right? Like, there's, there's definitely stuff we're going to go back to, you know, it's not like we like everyone's craving to travel internationally, for example, to see loved ones and family, you know, to, to socialize. Um, there, there are these, you know, fundamental, you know, human needs that I think, you know, that are, that are not going to go away. Um, you know, yes, you know, we saw with, you know, the vaccine, you know, pronouncements by Pfizer the other day, you know, Zoom shares went down 17% in one day. And I'm like, well, I can understand why, like, sorry, I shouldn't, I'm not giving any financial investment tips here, right? <laughs> I understand that like Peloton shares, like, because it's so one dimensional that that tanked, <laughs> but I like, you know, you know, despite the fact that people sometimes get Zoom fatigue, you know, it's a technology that's here to stay. Um, I use it way more than, you know, with phone, than phone calls for, you know, sales conversations, et cetera, um, when I can't turn up in person. It's the second, you know, second best thing. So I would say that, you know, I'm not saying buy Zoom shares. I'm just saying that the technology is going to be here and it's something we've all gotten used to. We'll, we'll be doing more qualitative meetings as, as, as a result. 
So that's a technology that's that's here to stay as well. Um, and I do think that um, you know international travel and business travel and 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 you know data science festival twenty twenty one will hopefully again be in the analog world um, because people still want to you know still want to meet and you know network and close a deal over you know a beer or a glass of wine or you know over another activity as opposed to you know purely you know being pure play virtual all of the time so yeah perfect well thank thank you very much anders uh, really really enjoying very refreshing uh, session uh, a great addition to our schedule uh, for this year's virtual uh, data science festival uh, and as you mentioned 2021 hopefully we are live and uh, hopefully at some point you'll be back in london and perhaps we'll be able uh, even to organize something uh, in person but in terms of today uh, i hope you enjoyed it i certainly have and uh, yeah thank you very much uh, for being part of the festival this year yeah and feel free to reach out and connect via LinkedIn and other social medias that you prefer. Uh, and again, the guys from Data Science Festival will send you uh, the URL where you can download the slides as well. And feel free to email me any questions you might have as well. I know there were plenty of more in, in the chat going on as well. Perfect. Well, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, and we'll see you all soon. All the best. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye.